Good morning and welcome to Fox Valley Today Headline Makers. I'm Bob Costigan, your host. Glad you could join us today for the program and it's a special treat to have as my guest this morning, Greg Zanis, who is an inventor of many things and I guess you've just done a number of different things uh, that we we're going to talk about today. And the viewers that normally see the show will notice that uh, things are a little different today because we've got some unusual, I shouldn't say maybe unusual, but different things today to talk about than I normally talk about. And uh, as I said, Greg, welcome to the program. Glad you could join us. Well, thanks, Bob. It's, it's exciting to be here. And I don't know if you remember, but I was here nine years ago with Bar um, Barb Nadeau about crosses and for over a decade now, I've been placing crosses at any time anybody asks me to. I have a group that is called Crosses for Losses. We're a nationwide group. And then with that, January, I mean, April the 20th, 1999, I was called on to go to Columbine High School when two gunmen killed 13 other people. When we went down there, we felt it was very important to put up the two crosses to include the two gunmen because they had mothers and fathers too that it did not want to see them go in that direction. And along, I brought today a painting of those 15 crosses that were on Rebel Hill. And also I brought okay, along... Let's see if we can uh, get this up so that the camera can uh, pick okay. it up. Also, I brought along a, a Pulitzer Prize that a photographer won for that same incident, since she's showing that. Okay. Okay, and here's the, uh, the painting of the crosses, uh, uh, Columbine crosses, and then you have the, uh, what is it, you said Pulitzer? That's great. and. Now then, for, for people who aren't familiar, the crosses for losses, you put the crosses up at uh, accident scenes where there's unfortunately been fatalities. I know we are talking before the program and you had mentioned uh, Oswego, uh, the unfortunate incident uh, a year or so ago where uh, five uh, students were uh, unfortunately killed in a traffic accident. So that's where the crosses are uh, being placed and you said what, 10,000? I put up over 10,000 in America and several in Canada and Mexico and mailed some to different places around the world. But, but Bob, I started out putting up crosses for homicides and I quickly realized that more than 50% of my crosses were for car crashes. Wow. And I've been to thousands of car crash scenes. Even yesterday on Fabian Parkway, an innocent person was killed. He wasn't the guy passing. And that led me and my sons to build a what we call a crash-proof car. So we've designed a one-seater car that you can see all these are the models that we made before we built the full-size car that will take on any kind of an impact. It's overbuilt. We have 12-inch by 5-inch steel I-beams that surround the wheels. And we also have three and a half inch tube stock that make what we've nicknamed a road cage. We're hoping that our next car will be able to take on any kind of a crash. If it hits a railroad train, we're hoping it'll bounce off of that. If it hits a tree, we're hoping that the, survive, the car driver will survive. Now I'm very fascinated uh, with this and that's why I'm glad that, that we have you on the program today. Uh, as many viewers may know or may not know, I was born and raised in the Detroit area and grew up around automobiles and uh, I remember when uh, automobiles, uh, you know, in the 50s and the 60s, gas was 25 cents a gallon and people didn't really think about uh, uh, safety that much. I know in the uh, uh, late 40s there was a Tucker that came out that was uh, a, uh, a car that was advanced as far as the safety technology. I know in the mid-50s Ford had uh, safety uh, in mind when they brought out a lot of their cars, but unfortunately the safety aspect didn't really catch on. People were more interested in the big fins and the chrome and 
big engines and you had cars like the GTO in the 60s and Corvettes and different things. So there wasn't the uh, emphasis put on crashworthiness, nor was there on fuel economy uh, and things like that until into the 70s and now today, of course, with the price of gasoline being over $4 a gallon for regular, people are looking at uh, ways to uh, uh, save on fuel and alternate energy as well as safety. And so it's great that you've got this. Uh, and explain more about uh, your car. Well, a couple of years ago, I joined a club called Fox Valley Electric Auto Asso Association. That's F V E A A. Dot org would be their web page and their president Ted Lowell and, and this group have been meeting since the 70s when they started converting electric cars on my first meeting there I took this model and this model to the club meeting and one of the guys yelled out hey why don't you build that car you know from these models and then right right away Bob I decided that that's what we're gonna do we're gonna build this car so 18 months ago we made a decision, and the very first and only time I've ever spoken at that club meeting, I asked them that, you know, I'm new here, and I'm here seeking knowledge that I cannot get in college. That's a song. And uh, ever since then, the club's been so helpful to me that, you know, I can call them up, people from Packard Bell, that's where we meet, or Lucid Technologies, or IIT. And these, these are the grandfathers, they understand electric cars. So the only difference with my car is I built a ground up because they have an average of 15 batteries and they're called deep cycle sixes or deep cycle twelves. And our president has 21 batteries, that's why he's the president. <laughs> so what I did is I designed a way to get 80 batteries into my car which this is how it works. It goes and uses up eight batteries to run the motors. When the eight batteries go 50 to 90 miles, they're depleted, and then we switch over to the next eight pack. And we can do that 10 times. So we have almost five or 10 times the range of any of their cars. So we're trying to